Thank you all for coming this morning. So I'm going to start by asking um, who here is doing surgery on a regular basis? Just Okay, wonderful. All right. Then of that list, I'm just going to run down the list. Would you guys mind just raising your hands for the things that you're... If you were picking two things off that list, just raise your hand for the things that you're most interested in, in hearing a lot about. So, uh, cystotomy. Okay. Elective gastropexy. A few more. Okay. Uh, GI surgery. So, enterostomy. Okay, big one. All right. Uh, eye surgeries. Okay. And wounds. Okay. All right. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll kind of focus more on the last three and a bit less on the first two on there. Um, okay, so general surgical principles. So what I wanted to talk about in this sort of first little segment is just things that I use for every surgery every day. Yeah, um, so whether it's an eye procedure or a GI procedure or any other type of procedure, there's some things that just recur over and over and over again. Um, and they may or may not be things that you're already using in your surgical practice. Um, but, uh, so we'll just kind of begin there. Um, and this really starts with the way I conceptualize any surgical intervention, and it's really as a, a, a dose-response curve. Yeah? So we're very used to thinking of medications as being a dose titration to effect, um, and I think it's worth conceptualizing a surgical procedure as a dose titration to effect as well. And on the one side of the scale, you have the burden of uh, surgical inflammation that you induce, the, the inflammatory response in the patient resulting from your surgical trauma, the burden of the anesthesia, the burden of low blood pressure under the anesthesia time, the burden of the infection risk that you're creating by bypassing the skin barrier. Um, and on the other side of that scale, you have what you're hoping to achieve from that procedure for the patient. Um, and sometimes you really have to focus that down into uh, a list of symptoms that the patient has that you're expecting to relieve. Yeah? Um, and I think it's uh, particularly important with a surgical dose uh, not to try and treat a problem that may be. Yeah? Because often the... Um, uh, the morbidity of a surgery can create a complication which is immediate. And so doing a surgical procedure to stave off a complication that might develop in that animal's future, but at that point in time has not yet occurred, um, always seems to me a slightly more of a gray zone with respect to surgical decision making. Yeah. Um, so if we move on from there, common surgical errors. So things that... Um, I still remind myself not to fall into these particular bear traps. Um, and prob probably one of the biggest ones is uh, an incision that is too small. And this is particularly for any surgery that is occurring within a body cavity. So abdominal procedures, um, thoracic procedures as well. Um, and the issue here is that if your incision is too small, the only way that you can really achieve visualization of the thing you're working on is to apply a lot of retraction or to exteriorize the structure and apply trauma that way. Um, and we get away with that in some instances. Um, but in general, if you can uh, be working in a field in which you're not having to place the tissue under a lot of tension, the burden of trauma that you induce is going to be less. Um, sutures too tight, so this is another common theme, and if you imagine the uh, tissue enclosed by the suture as being a kind of a ring with the suture around it, as soon as the tissue pressure within that ring rises above perfusion pressure, then you have the risk of necrosis and compromised healing in the post-operative period. Um, and this is sort of counterintuitive in that you're placing sutures, let's say you're placing sutures in a GI tract, you want to create that seal, right? You're concerned about GI contents leaking out, you want those sutures tight. But unfortunately, our dehiscence window at the three to five days, that's occurring because we over-tightened our sutures and exceeded perfusion pressure at that time point of surgery um, and then set ourselves up for delayed necrosis. So it's kind of finding that balance. And, and I would say I see far more issues from too tight sutures than too loose sutures. Um, so that's a, another one. Um, suture material too large. I'm pretty much never going above 3-0 or 4-0 for any uh, 
uh, intracavitary procedure. The only time I'm using two zero or above is closing a, a linear. Yeah, that's really the, the only situation where I'll go that large. And that's both because of suture bulk, but also not security and just not needing that much. There's not that much tensile force on your suture that you need large suture sizes in a small animal setting. Yeah, not in soft tissue anyway. Um, and then visualization. It sounds so straightforward, right? What, why would you do surgery on something you couldn't see? Yeah, but honestly, 95% of the skill of soft tissue surgery is achieving good visualization of the thing that you're working on in an atraumatic way. If you can't see it accurately, you can't cut it accurately. So packing, stay sutures, retraction, um, all of those little tricks that you're pulling into your surgical field are really what allows you to achieve an exact and an atraumatic procedure. But we'll get into that a little bit more as we, as we move on through. So in a little more detail, um, how it, what's this deal about exteriorization? So when do we get away with it? The, the situation, of course, that we get away with it and that we all begin our surgical training with is a spec. Yeah, you make a small incision, you exteriorize everything under a fair amount of traction, you get away with it because you're removing the thing that you're exteriorizing. So it doesn't matter that you have all of this tissue under traction and with compromised blood flow for the duration of the procedure because it's coming out anyway. Yeah. Um, when this doesn't work is if you try that same idea with, say, an enterotomy. So if you make a real small incision, slide fingers in, find the bowel loop with the foreign body, haul it out through your tiny incision, and then let it sit there with a sort of semi-strangulation thing occurring for half an hour, that's not going to go real well. Yeah. Um, so if you are working on an organ that is remaining in the patient, my advice is, as far as possible, try and work on it in situ. So in the, the space that it normally lives, rather than trying to drag it into an exteriorized position. Um, what about the whole deal with incisional length? Yeah, we're all taught some, somewhere early in our training, we often hear this phrase, oh, well, don't worry about a long incision, incisions heal side to side. Well, who's heard that? Is everyone, okay, yeah. All right, so yeah, that's true, but the, other, the counterpoint to that is that we know that the longer the incision, the more the post-operative pain for the patient, yeah? So a long incision, I think it's foolish to pretend that a long incision is without morbidity. A longer incision is more trauma, longer area to risk infection, longer area for the patient to self-traumatize, increased risk of dehiscence, more immediate pain for the post-op. Um, so there is a burden to it. Um, in my mind, the risks of that, so the, those statements under that umbrella, are outweighed by me needing to have good visualization of the structure that I'm working on. So let's say if I'm doing a linear foreign body and dealing with all of the sort of nuances of that in the cavity, I want a long incision so I can work on that. Yeah? Um, and ultimately, the complication that can occur from me getting that wrong, i.e. the septic peritonitis, outweighs for me the negatives of making that long incision to achieve what I feel I need to achieve. Yeah? But it's this sort of constant scale of assessing risk morbidity from one thing versus another. And you'll find yourself adjusting your incisional length. Don't be afraid to extend, I guess, is the take-home message. Yeah? If you feel like you can't really see what you're working on, extend. Yeah? Okay. Um, Males, uh, we'll clip the prep use to the side. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. Clipping, um, I guess, I've always thought of myself as an optimist, but I guess I'm really a pessimist um, because I uh, hope for the best, but clip for the worst. <laughs> yeah. Um, meaning that, let's say I'm going in to pull out a liver mass, the times I have to open the chest to do that it may, is maybe once, twice a year at most. But on every liver mass, I'm hanging over the technician's shoulders, go, don't remember, remember to clip the chest. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I'll clip much further and wider than I hope that I'm going to need. Because if you're caught in that kind of situation where suddenly you need to dramatically extend your field, the last thing you need on top of that is the mental stress of having to undrape, clip under the drape, re-prep, and then re-drape everything. And the sort of natural bird burden of contamination that comes along with that, right? So clip wider than you think you're going to need to. 
On a septic abdomen, most times it's going to be GI tract. Just sometimes it will be that prostatic abscess that's ruptured. And then you'll be extending your incision right down to the pubis. And it's going to be a real nuisance if you haven't clipped that far. Yeah. OK, um, male dogs, I use towel clamps just to clip the prepuce over to the side. That pulls all the musculature of the prepuce over and kind of creates a nice little window through here. You still have a couple of prepucial vessels to deal with, but much less than if you're leaving the prepuce relaxed and on midline. Um, and I'm sure you're all comfortable with the idea that you come lateral to the prepuce through the skin and the sub -Q, but your linear incision stays on midline all the way down. Optimizing exposure. So I live in a very luxurious environment these days. Yeah, there's lights. I mean, OK, they're elderly, and bits of the lights are currently dropping off. But glossing over that fact, I have lovely lights that I can move around and a table height that's adjustable. Um, but my life wasn't always in such a, a, a pristine um, environment. Um, and certainly, uh, I think if I had to pick one of those three things, so light, suction, cautery, it would be lighting. Um, and I certainly have used uh, the nice little LED headlamps you can get now. They're pretty cheap and inexpe pretty inexpensive. Um, they give a real bright light. Um, if your lighting in your normal working environment kind of sucks, then it might be worthwhile investing in one of those just to have as a backup, and particularly for the trickier things that always seem to happen down at the bottom of deep, dark holes. Yeah. Um, Cautery, why is cautery so lovely? Well, cautery is so lovely because it lets me keep a surgical field that is clear of blood so I can visualize the thing that I want to visualize. Yeah, that's the number one reason it's lovely. The number two reason is that it means I'm not leading, leaving a lot of clots behind in the patient at the end of my procedure. Um, we know that iron is the sort of number one bacterial growth medium. If you think of blood agar plates, blood agar plates and blood clots are kind of similar. If you want to grow bugs, you leave blood clots in there. Yeah. Um, so it helps you kind of avoid that. Um, why is suction so nice? Well, uh, mostly just for kind of decontaminating the field at the end. So if it's been a big GI procedure, even with everything you do to control leakage, there'll still be a little bit of schmoo just kind of sneaking out now and again. And once you have everything tidied up, your instruments changed, everything else kind of settled down, a final lavage just helps you bring that bacterial burden hopefully down a little bit lower. And suction really just helps you with that lavage part. Um, midline approaches. Um, falciforms. So anytime you're not in the caudal half of the abdomen, you're going to run across the falciform, right? Giant big chunk of fat, um, apparently useless. Um, its purpose in life is to stop you seeing what you need to see. <laughs> Um, it likes to bleed irritatingly, um, and if you work around it, so I'm really thinking now for GI procedures, if you work around it and just kind of move it out away from side to side or work through it, then unfortunately what happens in the days after your surgery is that you get a big steatitis occurring in that falciform, and if you get an incisional infection developing, it has this wonderful, wonderful place to kind of um, escalate within. Yeah? So my advice is anytime you're working cranial to the umbilicus and your incision is involving that cranial half of the abdomen, remove the falciform. Um, what does that look like? Um, the easiest way, sadly, is cautery. Who, which of you, who of you has cautery in your clinic? A few, yeah. So the easiest way is just to run up each side with cautery. If you don't have that, scissors work as well. You get these little bleeders that come off the peritoneum into the falciform that you'll come through with your scissors and just a clip and twist technique. So a pair of mosquito forceps on the vessel, twist it three or four times and then release it. That will normally deal with those little guys. Yeah. Um, you will need an encircling ligature up cranially. So, so kind of tucked around there. Um, if you're not coming through that area with cautery. So incise on each side, flip it forward, and then encircling ligature at the level of a ziphoid. And that just kind of shows you, your visualization is a lot better with that thing out of the way. Um, stay sutures. Yeah, who here is routinely using stay sutures? OK, great. Then I'm preaching to the converted. Yeah, um, anytime I can't see, stay sutures are going in. Yeah. 
If I'm worried about spillage, stay sutures are going in. If I'm putting a continuous line into a viscous organ and I want that tissue stretched out so I can run my line nicely, then I'm putting in two stay sutures. I clip the stay sutures out to the drape or you can kind of just about see it. You can put the mosquito forcep over your retractors and kind of hook it that way. Um, so you certainly don't need someone holding it. Um, uh, and it, yeah, it just keeps everything from moving around. Um, packing, so saline soaked sponges, just to hold things out of the way, prevent desiccation, catch any bacterial seepage which might be at risk for forming. Um, you kind of have to keep track, on, track of them a little bit for obvious reasons, um, but I use uh, saline soaked lap pads all the time just to pack everything off and see the thing I'm, I'm working at. Atraumatic handling sounds real obvious, right? None of us want to be traumatic when we're doing surgery. Um, but again, the thing I have to remind myself of is that when I touch skin, it's a keratinized surface. It's evolutionarily adapted to deal with being touched. That's not true as soon as we break that barrier and enter beneath the skin. And any touch in a subcutaneous situation is trauma, yeah? Um, we've all done explores where we were being, as I thought, really atraumatic. And then you look at the abdominal organs and the mesentery and the omentum at the end of your explore, and you notice all these sort of little red petechial areas just flowering on that amental surface. And that's just from the burden of touching it. Yeah? So if you don't have to touch it, don't touch it. Yeah? And a reasonably good exercise is in your next surgical procedure, just count the number of times you're touching tissue without actually moving that surgery forward. Yeah? If you think of the balance of cumulative manipulation versus interventions achieved, you're trying to minimize that ratio. Yeah? So your surgical efficiency becomes very important in achieving reduced trauma, reduced cytokine response, reduced inflammatory burden, less touch, yeah. Certainly gripping, anytime you're gripping tissue with forceps, that's not great. So if you can get away with just counter pressure rather than a grip, that's gonna work better for you. If you have to grip, use the most atraumatic forceps available to you. That's typically debakey forceps if you're working within the abdominal cavity. So the only time a rat tooth should be applied is to tenderness tissue or linear alba. Using a rat tooth on subcutaneous tissue, skin, GI tract, stomach, it's trauma that you don't need to impose. Yeah. These things aren't trying to escape from you. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, desiccation, yeah, obvious, but easy to forget. Um, keep surfaces moist as you're working on them. Um, just a little bit of drippage now and again is, is helpful. Um, round-bodied needles, so use a round-bodied rather than a cutting needle where you can. Um, simply because you are going to separate tissue rather than puncture tissue. So again, the burden of trauma is always lower with a round body needle compared with a cutting. Uh, interrupted versus continuous pattern. So just wanted to talk about this just for a second, and it really from a perfusion perspective. You can maybe get in the sense that perfusion is a word I keep kind of regressing to, um, and that's probably my critical care background just kind of creeping in there. So you'll have to forgive me. Um, but when I'm looking at healing along a suture line, as we've already said, that healing is contingent on all of those little capillary branches coming up to that incision line. When you run a continuous pattern, whether that's an intradermal pattern on a skin closure or a simple continuous appositional or a Cushing's, if you like Cushing's patterns, whenever you run a, a continuous pattern, you are enclosing that entire column of tissue along your suture line with your suture. So at the end of you li laying that line, the tissue pressure that you've created within that line, which is controlled by the tension that you've tied it at, affects all of the capillaries that are running along that tissue margin. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. The big difference between that and an interrupted pattern is in an interrupted pattern, you have natural breaks between your sutures where that perfusion pressure is not affected. Yeah? So if I'm, if I'm closing a tissue over which I have any concerns about healing risks, so let's say it's an enterotomy after a foreign body, the foreign body was sat there for a while, 
Um, I've tried to stay away from the compromised GI tract, but everything is still pretty inflamed and juicy where I'm having to put my enterotomy incision. That's the one I'm going to do an interrupted pattern in because that's the one that I'm worried about healing where I want my perfusion to that tissue edge as compromised as little as possible. If it's a cystotomy on a completely happy bladder with absolutely zero inflammation, then I want the speed that a continuous line gives me and I'll put a continuous line in. Um, if it's a midline spay closure on skin, normal skin, I'm going to run an intradermal pattern. If it's a wound that I'm worried about dehissing, there's some tension on it, there's some inflammation and trauma on it, I'm fine. maybe I've had to do a little flat to get the thing to kind of close without tension, that's the one I'm going to do an interrupted pattern all the way around in my skin, even though it's a complete pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so selecting between those two broad types, for me, is really based somewhat on the level of compromise that you're thinking about. Any questions on that? And I should have said earlier, if anyone has questions at any point, just raise a hand and jump in. Yeah. What about just myeloid? Yeah, so normal tissue. Um, uh, when we see dehiscence in, on a midline incision, it's pretty much always from pilot error of some kind. Yeah. So for me, it's always been my suture's broken or my knots have slipped. Um, it's very rarely because of perfusion compromise and healing compromise. So there I would be quite happy to go continuous. Okay. All right, uh, suture selection. Um, we've talked a little bit about suture size. Um, suture type, yeah, so monofilament, absorbable. Um, uh, we tend to default to PDS in the GI tract, something quicker absorbing in the urinary bladder, so monocryl or biasin, depending on which company you're using most of the time. Mm. So w I already mentioned that I'm coming to acknowledge that I have a certain pessimism in my approach to surgery. Um, and that's evidenced by the fact that I tend to mentally frame a surgical procedure based on the complications that I know can result from it and how to avoid them. Yeah. Um, and so in the sort of nuances of planning exactly what I'm going to do, I'm often thinking about, well, what are the commonest things that, are like, that I could screw up here and how can I not do that? Yeah. So the number one screw up for a GI surgery, of course, is dehiscence. Yeah. And I think there is some um, level of dehiscence which is inevitable and some that is definitely driven by pilot error and can be avoided. Um, and so for the parts that are more pilot error, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what can we do to, to minimize risks there. Um, and uh, in that context, sometimes when we're doing a GI surgery, particularly intestinal foreign body removal, there may be multiple areas of bowel that require intervention, which puts you into multiple enterotomies, which puts you into this idea of cumulative probabilities, meaning that if my risk of dehiscence is, let's say, 10% at any one site, and now I've made four enterotomies, then my overall risk is now suddenly 40%. Yeah. Um, and so I don't like those numbers. And so wherever you can avoid making an enterotomy, that's better. And we'll talk a bit from a linear foreign body perspective. We'll talk a little bit about how you can, some tricks that can help you with that. Yeah. Um, other things that can lead to enterotomies, enterotomy dehiscence, placing your incisions in areas that are already quite compromised, um, in a bit, uh, incompletely resuscitating your patient before the surgery. Yeah? So if they're dehydrated, hypervolemic, uh, the GI tract is a compensatory organ, organ in the dog, meaning that they will vasoconstrict to shunt blood preferentially elsewhere. And then if you add the burden of isoflurane and inhaled inhal anesthetic inhalants on top of that, they will vasodilate further. And now suddenly the perfusion in your GI tract is both is really bad, both because you lack volume and because it's vasodilated. And so getting these patients adequately fluid resuscitated before you ever make your incision, I think definitely decreases your dehiscence risk in the post-operative period, yeah? Because ultimately you're relying on that perfusion to heal the incisions that you're making. 
Um, the other complication uh, or common complication that I see aside from straightforward dehiscence is infections of the midline occurring after a GI surgery. And most times that's because I've forgotten to switch out my instrument sets or switch out my gloves. Yeah? So you kind of have to think of it as a surgical procedure occurring within another surgical procedure. As soon as you open bowel, imagine bacteria wafting everywhere. It's become contaminated at that point. You kind of have to consider all the instruments you're using that, at that point as contaminated and your gloves as contaminated. So as soon as you get that part of the procedure completed and your GI tract closed, then change out your instruments, change out your gloves, do a lavage, and then use a whole different set of instruments to do your abdominal wall closure. Um, obviously, you're not going. Obviously, if you don't do that, you're not going to get an infection every time. But if you're seeing infections of your midline after your GI surgeries, then chances are there may have been some cross contamination occurring at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so important to remember to do that, and easy to forget. Um, secondary barriers, so as soon as you have your GI loop with your foreign body in it, it uh, identified, pack it off from everything else. Um, you can use the outer wrap from a lap sponge packet, cut a little hole in it, bring it through that, get lap sponges in underneath, assume there's going to be spillage and plan accordingly. Mm, yeah. um, trying to minimize the amount of GI contents coming out, um, assistance fingers, if you have one, most times you won't. Doyen bowel clamps can work nicely. I always put doyens, particularly if I'm using a set that I don't use every day, I always put them on my finger before clamping them on the bowel because the amount of pressure that they create seems to be a little variable. Yeah, so if my finger can tolerate a doyle bowel clamp, then chances are the bowel will be okay with it. What you don't want to do is leave the thing on there for 15 minutes and then take it off and there's a big purple stripe where you left it and now you're worried about that, right? Um, so uh, just check them out a little bit before you put them on. Um, create a little separate landing pad zone to put the stuff that you're pulling out. So if you're doing a gastrotomy and pulling a bunch of old socks out of the stomach, lay a secondary drape in there adjacent. Otherwise, as you pick your socks out and transport them across your surgical field, all the drippage will kind of go everywhere and that's, you know, not exciting. Um, so land it somewhere close by and then as soon as you can, dump that off your table and out of your field completely. Um, switching gloves, we already talked about that a little bit. Linear foreign body material, we'll talk more about this, but the, as we all, I think, are fairly comfortable with the thought that linear foreign bodies are the highest risk in terms of dehiscence after our procedure, and some of that is due to mul the multiple enterotomies that are sometimes involved. Some of it is because a linear foreign body, just by its nature, really compromises the whole bowel that it's contained within. Um, and so it starts kind of cutting into and ulcerating that mesenteric border intraluminally throughout the duration of its passage. And so the burden of trauma just generated by the linear material itself is higher than for a, um, an isolated or discrete foreign body. So, um, how do I proceed on linear foreign bodies? Well, probably the first thing is just where I begin the procedure itself. And I think we're often taught um, in our surgical education that you should always do a full explore before you do anything else. Who's heard that? Yep, okay, all right. The one exception to that is linear foreign bodies, yeah? Because if you do a full, a full explore with the foreign body anchored and in place, you've run the entire GI tract, you've moved things from left to right, you're imposing more trauma by your manipulations on a bowel which is already under tension and under trauma from the linear foreign body that's anchored through it. So if you're going into an abdomen for a suspect foreign body GI explore, I would definitely recommend that you do not begin that process with a full explore. And instead, the place I always look first is the proximal duodenum. Yeah. So just gently move things off so you can look down into that right-hand gutter, visualize the proximal duodenum. If that's blunched and plicated, then you know right then and there that you have a linear foreign body. And the steps that follow from that point are different to if it's a discrete foreign body. So as soon as I've identified linear foreign body, I'll request whoever is at the front end just to double check under the tongue and make sure there isn't an anchor point there. We've all seen them embedded in the tongue, so 
if what I'm really asking them to look for is a wound under the tongue. Yeah, they may not see linear material, but if they see an ulcer or a deep cut under the tongue, there's likely going to be string or something like that at the bottom of it. So have a double check there first. Yeah? Assuming the mouth looks good, my next step is going to be placing stay sutures in the stomach to do the gastrostomy and release the pyloric anchor. And I'm not going to worry about exploring anything until after that has occurred. Yeah. Um, and that really is just to try and avoid that additional trauma that comes from manipulation. So checking under the tongue, gastrotomy, stay sutures in, gastrotomy, elevate everything up, and you're trying to release that pyloric anchor by pulling on it as little as possible. And so most times you're in that rather uncomfortable situation of kind of cutting blind. So you've got two fingers down in the stomach, you've got your fingers around that piece that's going through the pylorus and you're using the very tips of your scissors just to cut that and release it. Yeah. Um, and the reason you're trying to do it that way is that if you drag it out to a point where you can see it, that's tension that you're putting on the downstream end, which could cause a perforation that wasn't there before. Yep. So try and keep everything relaxed. Get that cut, get your gastric material out, close your gastric incision, and at that point you've done everything you can do to let everything release. Okay, now let's assume that this line linear foreign body material is the nice kind and it slides through bowel and it's kind of milkable, right? So we're talking plastic, we're talking tights, fabric material, something that you can milk and it moves. It's not the carpet string. Who's done linear foreign bodies with the carpet string? Yeah, right, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so milkable foreign body material, you milk it all, you're trying to get it into one place so you can remove it all through one enterotomy, right? That's your goal, yeah. Um, and once you have it all milked down and you're getting ready to make your enterotomy, um, you want that enterotomy positioned in bowel which is minimally compromised. Um, so you want that incision positioned ab or ad, not or ad. Try not to make it directly over the foreign material itself, yeah. Um, when do we have to go from enterotomy to RNA? Um, I still don't really know the answer to that question. Yeah? Um, but I can tell you that I've got progressively more conservative as time has gone by, and so far it hasn't bitten me in the ass. Yeah? Um, for me now, if, it, if it's red and can choose, I'm pretty happy that can stay. Yeah? Um, if it's red and can choose with kind of a little bit of purple, yeah, that can probably stay too. If I'm doubtful, I'll make my enterotomy, take the foreign material out, and then just kind of stare and stand and stare at it for five minutes and decide if the purple is moving in the right good direction. And if it is, it can stay. Yeah. If there's holes in it, obviously that has to go. Um, if it's kind of black, well, yeah, that has to go. Yeah. Um, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know here, but this is, you know... <laughs> Pearls, right? <laughs> Maybe. Um, positioning your enterotomy site, so we already said you want it ab or ad. Yeah? So if this is going up towards the stomach, going this way, you want your incision in tissue that has never seen foreign body. Yeah? So make your incision downstream and then reach up through to the foreign body material and then kind of pull it down and out. And that way, your incision is healing in tissue which is not already inflamed and contused. And so that gives you an advantage. Um, deciding between simple interrupted and simple continuous, we already talked a little bit about that yeah, and kind of what governs that decision. Um, and if I'm putting in a simple interrupted, um, all you're trying to achieve with your suturing of GI tract is to bring those tissue edges into contact so that they form a fibrin seal. Yeah, we all remember the steps of wound healing, right? So fibrin seal, their neutrophils come in, their macrophages come in and lay down the new um, uh, fibrous tissue scaffold, collagen, collagen migrates in, everything knits across. There's not a single component of that which is contingent on you having a real tight suture line, yeah? And pretty much any excessive pressure within that suture line is going to be more of a problem it creates more problems than it solves. Um, so you're not looking for um, uh, uh, you're not looking for a lot of tension along that line. Um, and for that reason, I'm not a huge fan of the leak test, right? Um, and the reason for that is that a leak test can only, first of all, 
back when I used to do leak tests, my leak tests were always negative. So I'd ponce around for 20 minutes with a syringe and a needle inflating things and trying to make things leak. And then I'd worry that I'd stretch the tissue around my suture line and I wasn't sure if I'd inflated it enough. And then, you know, it's just kind of a pain, it takes extra time. And they were always negative, but you still occasionally saw dehiscence. So the correlation between the predictive value of your leak test and your dehiscence, that didn't really seem to be there. Um, and then the other issue is that a leak test will only ever tell you to place sutures tighter. Yeah? It's never going to tell you that your sutures are too tight or that you've got too many of them. Um, and I think a lot of times when I'm seeing dehiscence, it's because there's too many sutures that are too tight rather than because the sutures that were placed were too loose or there were too few of them. So it tends to kind of always push you in the wrong direction. So personally, I don't bother. Um, if you are going to do it, then just remember that idea of perfusion to your wound margin. Yeah, just keep that image in your head. All right, um, simple continuous pattern, definitely quicker. Um, it's okay to do it in uncompromised small bowel. Um, you need that tissue stretched out to get a nice line, so stay, stay sutures are helpful there. Um, it's contraindicated in large bowel. So if you're ever making an incision in the large bowel, don't be tempted to close it with a continuous line. The perfusion, uh, the capillary density in large bowel is such that it doesn't tolerate a continuous line in the way that small bowel was, will, and dehiscence is definitely higher risk in that context. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about when you are choosing to cut into large bowel? Yeah, um, so almost never, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. So the question was, uh, if you're doing a GI surgery, when would you decide to make an incision in the large bowel? Um, and for a foreign body, pretty much never. Yeah, I can't actually recall the time. Yeah, if it's made it that far, it's going to make it all the way out. So you've got no indication to do a colostomy to remove anything that's got that far downstream. Um, so the times I'm making incisions there are for tumours, for subtotal colectomies, um, for you get the occasional ileocolic intersusception where you're stuck, it's beyond necrotic and now you've got to do an ileocolic anastomosis, those kind of situations. Okay. All right, um, once you've got your enterotomy done, stick some momentum over the top of it. I, generally, I used to suture it on, now I don't bother, it always seems to stick there. Um, just the ends of your suture tags will hold it in there. Provides a sort of additional perfusion, blood supply, a little bit of an extra seal. Um, so uh, why, why not, right? Um, luminal disparity. So we've all dealt with this. Yeah, this is a um, common issue if you've had a foreign body sat there for a while and the upstream bowel has really dilated up and you're bringing it to downstream bowel, which is normal diameter, and you're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and there's some pictures in some textbooks which uh, are uh, not very accurate um, and uh, so I'm going to emphasize you a couple of ways which I think can be helpful and then one extra for when it's kind of extreme. So angle cut is the obvious one. Um, you have about a kind of 5 to 10 degree angle on the narrow side and a much more oblique cut on the wide side and just bring them together and that can work for probably the majority of your uh, foreign bodies. Um, if you get into a situation where you kind of think you had everything lined up, but as you're coming up one side of the anastomosis, you sort of sutured the first half of it, you're coming up on the second half, and it looks like one side is just a tiny bit larger than the other one, then the way to sneak around that is just to space your sutures just slightly wider in the side where you've got extra tissue and slightly closer together in the side where you don't and that will just kind of sneak it down and in there. Yeah, and that will, works nicely, but only if that disparity is small. Yeah. Um, <coughs> occasionally, you run into a situation where you have kind of extreme luminal disparity, and the big one is that ileocolic anastomosis that we talked about, right, where so you're taking um, distal jejunum or ileum onto colon, and there you've got a real extreme angle. And the problem with your oblique cut in that situation is that if you really aggressively bring that angle down, you end up with this sharp point here and this tight point up in here. And the, both of these areas, but particularly this one, is a little bit prone to necrosis you know, because it becomes a very thin point. It's also harder to get sutures into. Um, so a nice technique that you can steal from vascular surgery is something called the lazy S-cut. Yeah? 
Um, and what you do here is rather than making a straight oblique cut, you decide the length of your spacing that you want, and then you come straight in at 90 degrees on the start of your cut, and then turn it into this lazy S, and then come straight out again. And when you open that out, it will form this lovely, nice round circle. Yeah? And so you avoid that business of having that pointy tip to suture to. So it works very nicely for creating a uh, end-to-end -end anastomosis on a situation where you have a big difference between those two GI tract sizes. Yeah, so good one to remember. If you're in the middle of something and you remember there's a thing but you can't remember the thing, then just call me. Yeah. Um, what not to do? Yeah. So don't ever do this. Yeah. It always dehisses right here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is even worse. Yes. Yeah, so don't do that either. Okay, uh, RNA, um, not rocket science on this, but always get your sutures in the place that's hardest to see um, before anywhere else. So that's mesenteric border, so always start on the mesenteric border. Um, and that's true for pretty much any surgical procedure. Put your sutures in in the spot that it's hardest to see first. Uh, embedded linear foreign body, so special case. So this is really a focus on how do we avoid the multiple enterotomies that go along with carpet string yeah, and or other textured material. Um, and the big thing here is to use a red rubber catheter trick. Now, I didn't invent this. This is with a very smart man called Dr. Holmberg, who invented it in 1972, I think, and he wrote it up as a case report, but it just sort of never went white, never went mainstream. Yeah. Who, who's seen this? Red rubber catheter? Yeah, okay, a couple of you. Yeah. All right, so you get your little piece of string or carpet material, whatever it is, and you've milked it as far downstream as you can, and then you make an enterotomy and you exteriorize a little piece of that string. And you suture it, just using Frio something, to the end of your red rubber cafter, and then you take your red rubber cafter and you insert it into the enterotomy that you've made. So here the tip is going into the enterotomy, and you start milking it through. And essentially what your cafter is doing is peeling that embedded foreign body out from the mesenteric border from the inside. Yeah. So where if you tried to drag it through, everything would bunch up and perforate. If you feed a red rubber cafter in and now it's sort of doing this, you're peeling it out from the inside, it will peel it out without causing any more trauma. So you then keep milking that thing down all the way down here. You can see it kind of coming around here and you just keep easing the bowel up over it and peeling out more and more of it. And eventually you get to a point, typically for me, I start running out of patience, sort of right either where the linear foreign body ends or when I get to the uh, ilium, yeah, or iliocolic junction. And then I'll typically make a second incision at the iliocolic junction if it's gone that far and just take everything out there. So what's the advantage of this? It means that you should be able to, do, to always do a linear foreign body through no more than a gastrotomy and two enterotomies. Yeah? If you're the patient type, you can actually milk that red rubber cafter through the iliocolic junction and into the colon and always work the way around the colon and then have your technician reach under the drape and take it out of the butt. Um, but I, just, I always get bogged down at the iliocolic junction and run out of patience. Yeah, so I end up making two incisions. Um, uh, but it's very nice for that situation of embedded string. Yeah, I've never had it not work. Um, yeah. Sorry, just a question on sure. Oral, yeah. So you've released it for pylorus. Oh, you, so, sorry, I have to reiterate. The question was, um, uh, do you begin this uh, oral or aboral on the foreign body end? Um, and so at this point, what you've done is made your gastrotomy, taken out your gastric material, released the duodenum. You've tried to milk it some, but it hasn't slid very far because it's embedded. And then you make that first enterotomy at the ORAD end, so upstream, yeah? Get enough linear material out to be able to suture it to your cafter, then start feeding your cafter down. If you need about six inches or so of cafter to be able to milk it, so I'll sometimes cut the cafter in half and then close that first enterotomy incision with the cafter in the lumen at this point. Just keep milking it around all the plication, and then when it's all the plication is resolved, you know you're at the end of the linear foreign body, and then you make a second incision and take everything out. That makes sense? Okay, good. All right. <laughs>
All right, so this is Skippy having that done. Um, and then I normally put NG tubes in patients after linear foreign body material issues just because of the ileus that tends to accompany um, uh, that kind of large scale trauma. Um, and having multiple enterotomies makes me obviously more worried about dehiscence. Um, and we know that early enteral feeding reduces both of those problems. So I'll typically default to a NG tube for the first 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then lavage everything, close everything, um, uh, uh, and there we go. All right. So the second request was for eye surgeries, right? Am I right? Okay, we've got 15 minutes left, I think. So, yeah, we're good. Now, I'm not an eye surgeon. Are there any eye surgeons in the room? Thank God. Because <laughs> probably what I'm going to tell you, they're not going to like. <laughs> yeah. but, um, uh, so this is eye, surger eye surgery from a non-boarded ophthal ophthalmic surgeon's perspective. <laughs> yeah. um, so entropion. Uh, so hardest thing about entropion for me is judging the amount of tissue to resect um, and trying to get that uh, kind of cosmetic um, tension correct, right? Um, and these are floppy skin dogs pretty much always. Um, and there's always that kind of goo in the creases there and it's sort of an awkward angulation. And so getting that cut position just right can be a little tricky. Um, and so the way I like to do that is to use a nice long pair of curved Carmalt forceps um, and put that below the eye and just use forceps to sort of tease through the amount of skin that I think I'm going to need and then keep checking back on the lower eyelid margin um, to see whether I've got it everted enough or not quite enough yet. And then once I'm real happy with how things look, then I'll finally clamp those car malts down, so just take them to the first click and then run a scalpel blade along the patient side of the, scalpel, of the car malts and that will give you that kind of really nice little crescent that you want. Um, whereas if I try creating that crescent freehand, then I find that much more challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, on, sorry? Um, uh, so the question was, do I do that on cats too? I'll be honest with you, I don't think I've ever corrected an entropion on a cat. Um, but would I do it on a cat? Yes. Yep. Um, simple interrupted suture line on that uh, uh, crescent of skin that's excised, um, just because you can get kind of nicer apposition with that sort of pattern. Um, Lesions, lacerations at the eyelid margin, yeah. So this is the kind of the big wart right on the eyelid margin that's just constantly causing a conjunctivitis and you want to excise that and you're having to do a wedge excision to do that. Um, the big thing here is in your closure, uh, doing enough layers on your closure, yeah. Um, so this is a situation where you truly do actually want uh, ideally um, at least a two-layer closure. Um, and so you're placing this first suture as a figure of eight pattern within the musculature. And this figure of eight direction is really what allows you to keep that knot away from the eyelid margin. Um, and you're making a point of including that palpebral muscle within that first bite and trying to make sure as you tighten that figure of eight down that you get this apposition here um, right at the margin, kind of as perfect as you can. Um, and then I'll place a couple more in that musculature uh, more distal um, and then finally kind of tension everything down and the question often is how much of the eyelid margin can you remove before distorting um, uh, the eyelid uh, to a degree that's inappropriate um, and I think you'll uh, ophthalmic surgeons will tell you one thing in response to that question and oncologic surgeons will tell you another um, and I probably do more oncologic surgery than I do ophthalmic surgery. Um, so I would say in the right dog, you can get, definitely get away with 50% and sometimes more. Yeah. Um, in, if you're in a situation on a lower eyelid where you're having to take substantially more than 50%, there is a flap called a lip-to-lid flap where you basically take a part of the lip margin 
you use the angularis auris supplying vessel, rotate that through up for 180 degrees, and that becomes the new uh, lower eyelid. It's actually, it sounds technically challenging, it's actually not that difficult to do, and it's a very robust flap, it has a great blood supply, it's rare for it to fail. So on the lower eyelid, that can work very well. The upper eyelid, yeah, that's harder because it won't reach up there. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you can definitely get away with um, removing quite a lot of the lower lid, especially in a floppy skin dog. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that eyelid margin resections? Okay. Well, yeah. Lip to lid. But, so the question was, what was the name of the type of flap? It's called a lip to lid flap, um, and it relies on the angularis auris um, vessel as its supplier. Um, enucleation, um, I suspect that most of you are better at this than I am these days, just based on how often you do it. Um, but I will say that, again, if we go back to framing our concept of a surgery in terms of the complications that you want to avoid, probably the biggest complication I want to see avoided with an enucleation is recurrent fistulas from retained lacrimal material and drainage from retained lacrimal material, right? Um, and so I like a, a kind of wide unblock method to make sure I'm getting all that lacrimal tissue so I don't have to worry about that. And I think the easiest way to achieve that is by using a lid harness. Um, so what you're doing here is taking 2O suture on something like that on a cutting needle. You're running a simple continuous line across the lids and you're leaving the two ends long and knotting them to create a harness. I don't worry about all of these little hemostats that you're seeing in the picture here. Just leave the two ends up and create a knot. And that gives you something to hold that keeps those lids under traction. Um, and then you incise your two, uh, you make a, a medial and a lateral canfotomy and incise the orbital ligaments on each end. And you'll feel the whole thing kind of pop up and start to elevate. And then at that point, you start to be able to visualize the sclera of the globe, just transect the extraorbital musculature at the level of the globe. Um, and that will mobilize everything and let you, allow you to get to the optic nerve underneath. Yeah. Curve forceps or right angle forceps on the optic nerve so you're not putting too much traction on it. You don't want to risk that idea of uh, blindness to the other side from excessive trauma there. Um, just clamp it, transect it. I don't worry about putting a ligature on there with the, while the globe is in place. Now I begin just by putting a clamp on, transect across the um, surface of the forceps to get the whole globe out of the way, and then it's much easier to place your ligatures behind the clamp than it is behind the whole globe. Yeah? So again, you're minimizing the amount of traction that you have to put on. Um, but I like the harness method because it kind of naturally pulls all the conjunctiva and all the retained, all the lacrimal tissue just naturally come out with that block. Um, any questions on nuclear? Yeah. Uh, what recently I've been reading not to even, not to even ligate that. That vessel at the back there? Yeah. I mean, it bleeds a bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I take the clamps off, I mean, so when you release that clamp, you're often then kind of poking around to find the thing you want to ligate. And when you do find it, I mean, it can be quite bleedy, right? So I would say case by case. If you can't make anything bleed, then fine. But if, you, if it's bleeding, I, I put a ligature on it. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Um, yeah. So along the, that line, that question, oh, there you are. Yeah, right. Okay. And I put pressure on it and then I do a lidocaine epinephrine slash block. Okay. Doing it wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> put it this way if you. Yeah, put it this way if you've never. Yeah. If you've never had a hematoma, then you're not doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, wound quick fixes. So this was another one we were interested in, right? Okay, so um, hmm. we could easily talk about wounds for six hours. So this is some, some pearls here. Chronic extremity wounds. So they're the things I'm going to focus on because they're the biggest nuisance. Yeah. Um, trunk wounds, you can pretty much always, trunk, neck, head to some extent, you can pretty much always close um, with, if you go with enough undermining and walking sutures. So they're rarely the problem that extremity wounds are. 
Um, extremity wounds can take a long time to granulate in, and that means lots of bandages and lots of rechecks. And the less frequently you do your bandage changes, the longer the wound is going to persist. So then that becomes even more expensive. Um, so they, they can be a little bit of a self-defeating cycle, chronic extremity wounds. Um, so a, a nice technique to be aware of is skin punch grafts. Yeah, who here is already doing these for extremity wounds? A couple people. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So why are they nice? They're nice because they're really reliable. Yeah. Um, sheet grafts are a bit, so your options when it comes to grafts are um, full thickness grafts, pretty much no one does that, partial thickness mesh grafts, which means taking a piece of skin, um, defatting the back of it and putting slits in it to mesh it, yeah. um, or punch grafts. Um, and the uh, number one complication with graft failure is due to accumulation of fluid between the graft in that first 48 hours, the graft lifting and failing to revascularize. Yeah, so that's why grafts, when grafts fail, 99% of the time, that's why. Yep. So what you're looking for is something that presents that, prevents that graft lifting. And the smaller the piece of tissue that you're grafting into its new location, the less likely that is to happen. And so the reason why um, punch grafts work so reliably is because you're grafting small pieces of tissue in. Um, what do you need equipment-wise to do this? You need two skin punches, yeah, um, a 6 mil and a 4 mil. A pair of forceps, Q-tip, and a small pair of scissors. Yeah. Um, what you do is you make a little hole in your granulation bed with your uh, four mil punch graft, and then you pop a Q-tip into it just to slow down the bleeding that comes out of that little punch. And while your Q-tip is sitting in that little hole, you take your six mil punch and you go on an area of skin elsewhere, typically up on the flank, and you create a little six mil circle with that six mil punch. Then you uh, take that six mil circle and take your tenotomy scissors and just trim all the fat and all the extra tissue that you possibly can off the back of it. It's a little bit fiddly. It'll take you, you know, 10, 15 seconds to trim all that down. And then you go back to your hole that has your Q-tip sitting in it and you take your Q-tip out and you drop your little circle into the hole and you leave it there. Mm -hmm. yep. And then you repeat that kind of 20 or 30 times, it gets a bit laborious. You might want to train your tech how to do it so he can scrub in to do some too. Yeah. And at the end of that time, on your granulated wound, you have all of these little circles sat in place. You then want to put a nice non-aderrant bandage on top. So I like, um, uh, what's that, Vaseline impregnated one. Someone help me out here. Not Alevin. <laughs> Adaptic, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, something as non-aderrant as you can get it. Telfer doesn't work real well. Telfer sticks too much, yeah. You want either one of the newer foam dressings or uh, Vaseline impregnated uh, gauze, something like that. Just lay that on there and resist the temptation to change that dressing for at least three days. Yeah, don't move it, yeah, because that's the point where all those little circles are getting their new blood supply. And if you come along and you're hauling the dressing back over top because you're so anxious to peep underneath, you'll shear off all those little vessels. So just leave it well alone. Let it cook. Yep. Sorry? No. Yep. Um, so let it cook under the dressing. And this is what it looks like at the three-day mark. So you'll find a lot of these circles. Some of them will look a little purple. Most of them will be this sort of reddish pink. Um, some of them will seem to have granulation tissue kind of coming over the top of them. And what they're doing at this point is just bedding into their new home. Yeah, they're creating friends, they're developing more blood vessels, they're having a little thing, but they're not really out and partying yet. Yeah, but they, they're, you know, still in the unpacking phase. <laughs> yeah. uh, then once you get to, so that just kind of runs through that process. Then once you get to about a week out, that's when they start to party. Uh, anywhere, pretty much anywhere that's handy, but often up on the flank, yeah, um, just where there's a lot of too loose skin. I'm nearly, it's, this is nearly always going to be on your distal hind limb or um, forelimb. So if you've got the patient in lateral up on the flank on the same side, works fine. Yeah. Do you prep the donor site? Yes. Uh, well, just clip it and surgical prep. Yeah. Um, no, 
No, I'm actually, so the question was, is it important that it goes below the granulation tissue? You actually want just a little home within the granulation tissue. I'm out of time. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but well, let's finish this little segment unless someone throws us out the room. Okay, um, uh, there was another question over here somewhere. No, I'm just yeah. asking what you're scrub for the uh, Just your same scrub as for anywhere else. Dilute Chlorhex, yeah. And for the wound, I normally do a dilute Chlorhex scrub, but as soon as you get past your two, three minutes of contact time, dump sterile saline over it to wash all the soap off. The chlorhexidine is cytotoxic to granulation tissue, so you don't want that sitting on there. Yep. Any other questions on that? No. Okay. I apparently have to go. Sorry. Email me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But so real quick, though. So here, it's all starting to party. You can see these little rims of epithelial tissue just forming around here. And then it starts to spread out. This is by 10 days. Yeah. And then... There, you've just got that one little area left now, so the dog's fine without addressing at this point. And then the one thing you have to watch out for is if you've got real fluffy skin up on the flank and it's not so fluffy down, you will, it will look a bit fluffy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yep.